What's up you guys, Dr. Gooden back with another lecture about plyometrics. This time we'll be talking about how to incorporate plyometrics into a training program. Dr. Gooden here back with another lecture. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, Professor of Kinesiology here at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this uh, lecture video, part two in our plyometric series, we'll be talking about how to incorporate plyometric activities and plyometric training into your strength and conditioning program for different types of athletes. Now this information comes from chapter 18 from the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning put out by the NSCA. And in the first video, we talked about both the neurophysiological and the mechanical models of plyometrics in order to describe how they increase uh, force production and the rate of force production in athletic movements. And in this video, we'll be talking about how to incorporate plyometrics into a training program. So let's dive right into the material. This comes, as I said, from chapter 18, uh, which was written by David Potak and Donald Chu. Now, the first step of any training program is to run through a needs analysis. What are the demands of the sport and the unique needs of the athlete? And then to reconcile those two things, figure out where's the carry over between them, what are the unique needs of the athlete based on health history, based on their anthropometrics, based on their training age and training history, based on their position on the team, and what are the unique demands of the sport, what are the metabolic factors, the uh, force time characteristics of the athletic movements, any biomechanical considerations when you look at the athlete and then uh, the movements they'll have to perform in their sport. All of these things are uh, important at the outset of designing any training program. And we've talked about them before back in chapter 17 when we were going through the first step in designing a resistance training program. So by understanding each sport's individual requirements, the positions within the sport, and the needs of each athlete, a strength and conditioning professional can design a safe and effective plyometric training program. After we've considered the needs of the athlete and the demands of the sport in our needs analysis, then we want to consider the mode of plyometrics. Are these going to be primarily lower body, upper body, or midsection slash uh, trunk plyometrics. So for lower body plyometrics, these are appropriate for virtually any athlete in any sport. And this is because the majority of sports require some sort of locomotion, moving your body from point A to point B. Um, they involve acceleration and deceleration. Most of them involve change of direction. And even if they don't involve change of direction, even if it's just in the sagittal plane and it's all linear like track and field, well, it still involves vertical ground reaction forces. And so lower body plyometrics are a great way to improve the lower body's ability to generate force rapidly and to release it elastically during that concentric muscle action. Now, there are a wide variety of different lower body drills with various intensity levels and different directions that we can incorporate. So let's look at this table from the text. On the left, we see six different types of lower body drills. We have jumps in place. So this is where you would jump straight up and land back down where you took off from. So there's no box to jump onto or object to jump over. So some examples of these types of jumps could be a squat jump or a tuck jump. And you could do these um, in a repetitive motion. So each jump is reactive or you could do them in singles, like one at a time with three to five seconds of rest between them. And that would be less fatiguing um, but it would allow the athlete potentially to jump with higher intensities with each jump versus a repeat jump in place. That's going to uh, stress the stretch shortening cycle to a greater degree and could potentially develop the power endurance of the lower body. We also have standing jumps. These emphasize either horizontal or vertical components. So this could be like a standing broad jump or a uh, standing vertical jump. These are maximal efforts with recovery between repetitions. So unlike the repeat jumps in place, now we're recovering fully in between repetitions, not just three to five seconds or not right into the next jump as in the first category, but now we're resting maybe 30 seconds to a minute in between attempts. Then we have multiple hops and jumps. Uh, multiple hops and jumps involve repeated movement, and these can be viewed as a combination of jumps in place and standing jumps. One example of the multiple jump is the zigzag hop. So you're essentially zigzagging diagonally back and forth, hopping either over a barrier or just over a line. 
or something like that. So uh, jumps in place, standing jumps, multiple jumps, there's, they kind of overlap with each other, but I hope that you can see the delineations between them and it's helpful just to categorize them uh, in these different types of jumps. So those are the first three. Now let's move on to bounding. Bounding drills can be either single leg or double leg, so unilateral or bilateral. Um, but instead of emphasizing the vertical component like jumps do, Bounds emphasize the horizontal component. And sometimes you can use um, distance instead of number of contacts in order to quantify the volume of the bounding that you're doing. So let's say that you prescribe 20 meters of bounding or 50 meters of bounding instead of with vertical jumps, you might uh, prescribe five uh, sets of three vertical jumps or something like that. Next, we have box drills. These drills increase the intensity of multiple hops and jumps by using a box. The box can be used to jump on or off. The height of the box depends on the size of the athlete, the landing surface, and the goals of the program. I would add to that also the abilities of the athlete. Uh, for instance, you could have a, athletes of the same size uh, with a, on the same landing surface and the same goals, but maybe one athlete is more powerful, so they may require a higher box. Box drills can involve one, both, or alternating legs. So again, unilateral or bilateral. And then finally, we have depth jumps. Depth jumps involve stepping off of a height, so maybe off of a box, contacting the ground, and then immediately jumping as high as possible, either uh, vertically and then landing in place or over another barrier, uh, minimizing your ground contact time. So the goal is to absorb all of that force eccentrically, store it in the um, elastic components of the stretch shortening cycle, decrease the amortization phase, and have a rapid and forceful concentric muscle action uh, which then propels you to potentially an even greater height. So depth jumps are really great uh, for especially those high speed sports for increasing things like uh, the amount of force you can produce at your top speed where your foot only has about 100 milliseconds to spend on the ground at the elite levels. Now we also have upper body plyometrics and these can include uh, medicine ball throws where there's of course the reactive uh, uh, cocking mechanism of the arm or um, uh, if it's if it's a single arm or you know like with a chest pass you're going to bring it back and then throw it with the with the force where you don't have to decelerate the implement for instance if you're doing a bench press and you're trying to accelerate the bar as fast as possible well before you get to the end you have to decelerate the bar or else you're going to pull your <laughs> your shoulders out of your sockets but with a med ball you can accelerate all the way through and release the ball you don't have to slow it down so you can achieve a much higher velocity they also involve catches so you might want to do controlled med ball catches where you have the person maybe lying down, uh, facing up, and a partner over their head, and they drop a med ball to the outstretched arms, and you have to cushion it, and then um, you know throw it back up into the air. The partner catches it again, gives you a controlled drop. You catch and then toss. So catches are important. And then different types of push-ups, maybe clapping push-ups or jumping push-ups, or maybe hands elevated push-ups where you're actually leaving, your hands are leaving the ground, and then returning uh, to, to whatever surface they started from. And then we have trunk plyometrics. These are exercises for the trunk, so most core training type exercises that are um, isotonic in nature, and they would be performed plyometrically, provided that some movement modifications are made. So for instance, you could, instead of a Russian twist where you're um, on the floor and you're twisting back and forth holding a med ball, maybe now you have a med ball on a string and you're against the wall and you're twisting back and forth and the wall and the ball is bouncing off the wall. So that's a little bit more plyometric. Or maybe instead of some sort of a crunching movement, maybe now you're doing um, an overhead ball toss from a crunching position and you're throwing that ball as far as you can at the top, your partner retrieves it and then gives it back to you. Um, another one could be if your legs are up in the air and maybe you're doing, I don't know what they're called, like lower abdominal crunches or, or leg raises or something. Uh, instead of just letting your legs lower and then come back up, maybe your partner's now pushing your legs forcefully down to the ground. You have to decelerate and then pull the legs back up. So with all of these different modes of plyometrics, we have to talk about how to modulate the intensity. And as I've mentioned, I have another video demonstrating some various plyometrics, which I'll link to somewhere in one of these corners on the video uh, where you can where you can see uh, what some different higher and lower intensity plyometrics might look like. But the reason that we want to modulate intensity is because uh, this can control help control the amount of stress placed on the muscles, connective tissues, and joints. Plyometric activities inherently produce a lot of joint and connective tissue stress. 
And this is controlled primarily by the type of drill. So here are the four factors that can modify the intensity. Points of contact. Typically, reducing the points of contact increases the intensity of the drill because now you have one less limb in order to disperse those forces across. For instance, if you do a um, depth jump with two legs and you hit the ground, you have those two legs to cushion yourself to absorb the forces and then fire concentrically. If you do it uh, unilaterally with just one leg, now not only do you have uh, double the force on that single leg, but you also have the added uh, instability of the movement as you try to balance with that asymmetrical load on the leg. We also have the speed of the drill. So the faster you're going into that drill, let's say a bounding drill, the higher the intensity or the higher the stress will be uh, just because the velocity is higher. Also the height of the drill. So if you're going to jump over, let's say low hurdles, that's going to be a lot less intense than jumping over uh, waist high hurdles. Uh, where now gravity has a lot longer to accelerate your body back down to earth. And then also body weight. So depending on the individual, uh, the higher the body mass, the higher the intensity of any plyometric exercise that they're doing. For instance, if you have a 350 pound uh, lineman, uh, it's going to be a lot harder for them to do some sort of a repeated depth jump type of drill versus, let's say, a 160 pound sprinter. Two very different types of athletes that both need plyometrics to some degree, but we have to take into account the much, much higher uh, risk associated uh, with uh, a heavier individual. So is the reward of that activity worth the risk? And we might have to scale it back for them. Next we have frequency. So typically athletes will require at least 48 to 72 hours between plyometric sessions. Now this of course is different depending on the volume and the intensity of plyometrics. Maybe it's just a small maintenance uh, plyometric session. Maybe it's just plyometrics incorporated into the warm up at lower intensities before the main workout. In this case, they probably don't require 48 hours. Or on the other hand, maybe, maybe the entire session was devoted to plyometric type activities, in which case 72 hours or more should be given. So this is just a ballpark and it depends on if the plyometrics are the main focus, it depends on the volume and it depends on the intensity, but Typically, two to three days in between sessions is ideal. Now, as far as recovery goes, we want to give plenty of recovery between uh, sets and sometimes even between individual reps within a set. One thing that we have to remember and keep in mind is that plyometric activities, like let's say the box jump, which is often used, they are not supposed to be metabolic conditioning activities. They're not endurance activities. And if they're used for those things, then it's not for the development of stretch shortening cycle or explosiveness or uh, you know, lower body power. For instance, in the sport of CrossFit, and I call it a sport because it has very specific demands that it requires of athletes. And so if you're going to compete in CrossFit or you want to be good at it, you should train in that way. Uh, but in the sport of CrossFit, there are often things like re repeat box jumps, you know, sets of like really high sets, as many reps as possible for time or sets of 50 or sets of 100. And this doesn't, this doesn't develop the stretch shortening cycle in the same way that let's say five sets of three depth jumps does. Uh, nor would it be good for an explosive athlete to do those things because now they're just training endurance, uh, whether it's muscular endurance, um, even cardiovascular endurance, going up and down, up and down the whole time. Maybe power endurance of the lower body, but it's not training uh, peak, uh, peak power or peak force development. All of that to say, oftentimes I see coaches programming too little rest in between repetitions or in between sets for plyometrics. So the NSCA recommends uh, that recovery from depth jumps, which are very high intensity plyometric movements, um, a recovery of five to 10 seconds between repetitions and two to three minutes between sets. Now the time between sets is determined by a proper work to rest ratio, i.e. one to five or up to one to 10. And it's specific to the volume and type of drill being performed. For instance, again, if you're doing it like a low intensity line hop drill and it only lasts five to 10 seconds, and maybe it's part of your warm up or you're ramping into something more intense, you probably don't have to rest, you know, two to, two to three minutes in between that and the next set of it or in between that and the next thing. And again, it's here in the slides, these drills should not be thought of as cardiorespiratory conditioning exercises. So for instance, let's take uh, jump roping. Jump roping can be done for the cardiovascular benefit or the, or the metabolic conditioning, or it can be done for the plyometric and stretch shortening cycle benefits. If you're doing it for the cardio, 
then you should go for time. You should go for intensity during that time. You should go for as many uh, you know, uh, jump rope contacts as possible. If you're doing it for the plyometric benefit, then you should scale that back and do shorter sets and make sure that you're not getting winded and that you're fully recovered in between sets. So very different outcomes. And then finally, there's a recommendation that drills for a given body area should not be performed two days in succession. So for instance, you probably don't want to do depth jumps two days in a row, or you probably don't want to do plyometric push-ups two days in a row. And it's not that you can't do that or that you will get injured, but it could lead to overtraining. And perhaps the, um, the SRA curve, the stimulus recovery adaptation curve, you're st you might still be in the middle of that uh, when you engage in that activity the next day. So better to let that curve fully come back to normal before you hit it again. Next, we have volume. For lower body plyometric drills, uh, plyometric volume is expressed as foot contacts per workout or if it's bounding drills, then in distance. For upper body drills, volume is expressed as the number of throws or catches per workout. The recommended lower body volumes vary for athletes with different levels of experience. It also varies for athletes of different body sizes. Um, but here in this table, 18.4 from the text, we have some guidelines to follow. So beginners, 80 to 100 foot contacts, intermediates, 100 to 120, and advanced, 120 to 140. So you can see it's a considerably narrow range, 80 to 140 from beginner to advanced. So it's not like an advanced athlete is going to be doing triple what a beginner can do or should do. It's, it's much more constrained than that. And especially because you have to consider that an advanced athlete will also probably be engaging in much, uh, much higher intensity plyometric activities than a beginner. They might be doing depth jumps, whereas a beginner might be doing uh, you know, mini hurdle hops or just uh, standard vertical jumps or, or small box jumps. So we have to consider those things as well. Now, as far as program length goes, a lot of the literature is focused on programs ranging from six to 10 weeks, showing an improvement in stretch shortening cycle um, efficiency or ability or jump height or whatever the outcome is. However, that doesn't mean that you should stop a plyometric program at 10 weeks. Um, or that you should never do one shorter than six weeks. What it does mean, though, is that those, that those are the lengths of programs that have been studied. So for most sports, plyometrics should be included almost year-round in at least some dose. In some parts of the season, you want to de-emphasize them and maybe relegate them to just the warm-ups or just to, to low-intensity plyos during the cool-down. In other parts of the season, uh, maybe as you ramp into competition or during the competition phase, Maybe plyometrics take over a more important role after you've built your strength and your power, and now you're translating that into, uh, into elastic and reactive components because that's what's required for your sport. Now, as far as progression goes for plyometrics, we need to keep the principle of progressive overload in mind. So we want to be progressing the volume, uh, the intensity, and the complexity of our plyometrics as the season goes on. And as we move from general training to more um, advanced and sport-specific training as we get closer to competition. Also throughout the course of an athlete's uh, competitive cycle, right? From, from the earlier ages uh, in their long-term athlete development program into the maturity of the career, these plyometrics should be improving overall or increasing overall in the intensity, in the magnitude of forces that uh, their body is exposed to, potentially in the volume and in the complexity as well. So the key point here is that effective plyometric programs include the same variables that are essential to any training program design. The mode of plyometrics, the intensity of the drills, the frequency with which you engage in plyometrics, recovery time between them, the volume of any individual session, program length, the progression, and the warm-up will be the same too. A, a general ramp protocol tends to involve some low-level plyometrics. Uh, and even maybe some media, uh, moderate to higher level plyos as you get into the potentiation part of the warm-up. And it should be the same for a plyometric program. So that concludes chapter 18, all about plyometric uh, programming and the physiology of it. Don't forget to check out parts one if you missed it, as well as the uh, video showing some demonstrations with yours truly trying to jump <laughs> and showing you I don't have any hops. Uh, check out those other two videos. Let me know if you guys have any questions down in the comments and I'd be happy to engage with you there. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting the channel. There's a few ways to do that down in the uh, video description if you want to check that out as well. And I will see you guys on the next video.